how does BIM impact design? This is all about just digitizing an industry. It's not necessarily about using a bit of software or the client asking for something. It's digitizing the whole industry. It's a massive, massive task. It's about reducing the waste, not only the waste in what we build, uh, but how we build it, the time, the money, the carbon, just getting rid of all of those. Um, this is um, the structural model for the Garden Bridge. Um, whether you love it or hate it, it's a, it's a scheme that we've designed and optimised at every single point in order to reduce the costs of it. Um, it's not Revit, it's Grasshopper and Rhino, but the data that comes out of that is BIM competent data. Uh, improved visibility. This, this process allows people to see things much earlier. It scares a lot of people sometimes, but it's, it allows you to see it and act upon that data. Scan data allows you to see a whole load of things. This broad gate circle that we've just finished um, the refurbishment of, that's a full section of scan data that we've just did years ago, four or five years ago that we did this. And then that allows you to, have to act upon that data with greater confidence, allowing you to display your, your models, your schemes, your designs, and communicate them to the clients a lot better. The communication allows you to do it in a much better format. There are actually very few people out there or outside of the industry who can take a 2D plan and three-dimensionalize it in their mind and talk about the relevant issues. It comes as quite a shock to some people that they can't read a plan. There are some people in the industry that can't read a plan. Um, and that allows you to see other things. Multidisciplinary design. I work at Arab Associates. We are multidisciplinary design practice. We have architecture, structure, MEP, fire, lighting, all the different disciplines in one space, in one office space, and we work like that on every single project. That gives a greater understanding. So all the people in the room, whilst we're talking about a particular project, can sit around and talk about the same issues and see the same issues, and it leads to alignment. <coughs> um, this is uh, the Believe in Better building by Sky. This is a timber construction building from client instruction to completion in less than 12 months. That was quite a rapid design pro uh, program. We've just uh, won at the Timber Awards last week uh, six of the eight available awards on the night. Not, not due to BIM entirely, it's actually a really nice stone building, but it's, it's working. Um, from a basic fundamental design point of view, from an architectural point of view, we used to have in the traditional 2D process, a team member doing certain things, one doing plans, sections, elevation schedules, another completely disconnected 3D model, all to produce your documents. From a simple fundamental level, using a piece of software, not saying that's BIM at all, but you can have that same team doing three different projects. Same team, bit of investment, bit of training, bit of hardware. This is why I don't believe it when people say the return on investment isn't there, because I can do three more projects with the same number of people. The government has very nicely arranged for a, a suite of documents to be created, commonly known as the BIM pillars. But they're a suite of documents now. Anyone can pick up these documents and say, right, OK, we've got the legal thing sorted, we've got the process sorted, security issues, everything, all these standard questions that people keep asking. Planning, how do we plan this? How do we do it? How do we work with one another? What sort of information are we going to produce and what format is it going to be in? It's all outlined in these documents and classification. We can now take any bit object within a building, within reason, and say, right, using this same classification system, this is, how, this is how we can describe it across all the disciplines. Soft landings, Terry's already mentioned, post occupancy evaluations, trying to figure out how buildings are working, trying to measure up or balance the, the gap between as designed and as built. 30% difference currently <coughs> between performance of the building as designed and as built. We're trying to reduce that, reduce the carbon, reduce the waste in that process. Best practice at, at project level, commercial arrangements. Make sure our appointment documents, our legal deliverables are all nailed first. If we don't, then the, the system starts to fall apart from that point. There are documents out there, CIC, BIM protocol does that for us. Append it to your contract, everyone's moving in the same direction and understanding. Planning, PAS 1192 part two sets out this whole process of how you should plan and work with this building. Um, with this process. And then you do your work, you get on and do your design work. Then we check that, we make sure the data in there is in the right format for each different design stage. It's, as Terry said, it's a digital checklist. It's not a manual process where we're going through reams and reams of data. And then we share it, we confidently share our information with the people that need it. It has a certain status to it, they can use it for information, they can use it for their particular calculations, quants, whatever they're doing, but they know the purpose of the information they're receiving. And that's part of the, the key to it. And we do that digitally. This is the Singapore Sports Hub. The model on the, on the right-hand side is our design model. That's in construction on the left-hand side. These are the visualizations of the, the Sports Hub itself, and that's it during construction. That's complete now. Won another BIM award last year for um, the contractor side, not our side. We had no BIM deliverables in that. We just did it anyway because that was sensible for us. The contractor took that on board, pushed the BIM through the 4, 5, and 6D processes, and actually won awards for it. And we do that consistently. The whole point is now that, as Terry said, we can go on, we can order a holiday. 
I can take my phone out and I can scan anything with a barcode and it works consistently throughout all, our, all of our objects, no matter what we're trying to buy. And what we're trying to do is do that, but for the construction industry, so we can all swap, chop and change information between all the different parties throughout the entire supply chain consistently. And use the BIM standard. They are there for a reason. Don't make up your own standards. They're all there, they're ready, they're done for you. As soon as you start to change them or tweak them, they're not standard anymore, they won't work, and the system will fall apart again. And people do it. We've got to have fun when we do this BIM stuff. So this is a project that um, Arup funded us to do. Um, it's called Project Ove. Uh, our founder is Ove Arup. Uh, it's a 170 meter tall building based on a human body. It's just a bit of fun. But we did it three years ago just to say, this is what we can do with technology right now, with the software. We scaled the building up. It's a scan of a person, my colleague Andy, um, using the laser scanning techniques we use on Broadgate Circle. We built a building it's full of MEP and we tried to stay as true to the body systems as we could. So it's got a heart with the pump rooms, it's got the lungs, which are the eight fat units, and it's a full design system. It's not just geometry, we can take calculations off of it. We can change any object within the MEP and plumbing system, and it will recalculate through the entire system right back to the eight fat units. These aren't just processes just to show off. These are processes that, this is a project that we did in order to create individual processes for how we work on a daily basis. The structural die grid you can see there, the diagonal um, columns and beams, are taken from the same design aspects that we did on the gherkin. So they are real, true um, design studies that we've used, taken those, applied it to this, and then created worksheets to allow the rest of our staff to work sensibly um, throughout this process with the software. Um, there's not much else to this video, but it's just this had massive industry involvement. When we started to say to people, we're doing this, do you want to get involved? We had people from London Underground getting involved, helping with the scanning and the translation of the data. Uh, we had people from scan companies say, yeah, we'll, we'll scan your guy. The, the people that got involved uh, from an FM point of view, taking this and taking all the data that they can use for operation of the building. We had Turner and Townsend take it and do a cost exercise on it. They worked out it's 13 and a half times more expensive than the most expensive thing they've ever costed, which is the perfume hall at Harrods. It's completely unbuildable and never be built, but it's just an example of what you can do with the software. But leave you with that one message. If you, if you work in this industry and you think this isn't for you, you're wrong. It's to do with everyone. It affects every single person throughout the uh, process of designing, delivering built infrastructure. <laughs>